even very progressive countries like Iceland, it's not accessible. Um, and there are plenty of states where you can't get naloxone unless you go to a hospital or to a police station. And not to put anybody in a box, but there are a lot of people who are, if they're overdosing on opioids, the last place they want to go is a police station or hospital. Right. Um, and so putting that technology in the hands of people was, you know, very appealing. There's another problem though, which is the structure of naloxone is so similar to the structure of opioids that the precursors that are necessary to make it are the same precursors that you would use to make the opioids. And so wow. they're very, very highly controlled. It was very hard to get. And so given those, the fact that it was very difficult to get the precursor more accessible, we were like, okay, well, maybe we should put this on hold. But then things started getting worse and we got worried and we were like, okay, how do we crack this nut? And we had this idea uh, about a year ago that was this moment where we said, okay, well, they won't let us have the antidote because it's uh, for silly reasons. And it's like, okay, and they won't let us have the things to make the antidote because they're too similar to the poison. What if we just make the antidote from the poison? And so the chemistry team started working it out and figured out a way that we can actually manufacture – naloxone from oxycodone oh wow in two steps <laughs> because they're so very similar it's, it, and and the poetry <laughs> of making the making the antidote from the poison is uh i think wonderful you're listening to the vanu podcast the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation old vanu publications podcasts guest articles and much more go to vanupodcast.com and now your hosts shane and jason Welcome to the Vol New Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast and everything found on the website is covered by BIPCOT's No Government License. This allows reuse and modification to anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. Uh, so today is the 57th episode of the podcast, uh, another in our long crypto anarchism series, where we explore some sort of technology that can help make you more invul invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the state of servile society. But what about natural coercion, per se? Things like deadly allergies, terminal diseases, and the like. How about the unnatural coercion concerning the huge faci uh, fascistic uh, socialistic healthcare uh, system we have today? Is there anything we as Venuans can do outside of diet and lifestyle? Thankfully, Dr. Michael Laufer and the Four Thieves Vinegar Collective uh, have been working hard at decentralizing and open sourcing the field of medicine. Uh, in response to the huge surge in the price of EpiPens a few years back, they garnered mainstream attention after putting out their $30 DIY EpiPencil. Uh, well, and uh, while they were working on some other medicines, uh, their major project is the Apothecary Microlab, which is a DIY automated chemistry robot that you download and assemble, uh, enabling people to uh, synthesize their own drugs. Uh, we'll talk about uh, these things and more with my guest today, uh, Dr. Laffer. So, Dr. L Dr. Laffer, welcome to the Vani Podcast. Uh, I'm really happy uh, to be chatting with hey, you. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Hey, yeah, no Yeah, great no to problem. be here. No problem at all. Um, so, I guess uh, I, I guess first off, um, I, I honestly, uh, I, I heard about... Uh, um, what you, the the epi pencil um, through the news, but I really didn't uh, look any further than that back when that happened. So it's uh, uh, I thought it was a really really cool idea back then, and I think it's uh, even cooler now for looking into uh, the, all the other cool stuff that uh, that uh, you and uh, um, I guess your team is working on. So um, I guess first off, uh, for those who uh, may not be uh, familiar with you, uh, why don't you uh, start by providing a, a brief introduction? Uh, who are you, and uh, what do you do? So I'm the chief spokesperson for the Fourth East Vinegar Collective, and we work to try to find ways to bring medicine and medical technology to people who don't have them for whatever reason. Uh, the main reasons, of course, that people don't have access tend to be either price, 
or legality or lack of infrastructure. And when you give people information and ways to get information, then they can build these things themselves and it cuts out all of those intermediaries and all of those problems vanish. So we work on a lot of different angles of that and trying to keep people as healthy as possible. Very cool. Very cool. So I guess uh, um, this is kind of a more of a like your, your, your story sort of question, but what brought you into the crypto anarchist world and, and what led you to get involved? Uh, or I guess I think I think co-found uh, the fourth East Venture Collective. Uh, you know, what got you to this point? Well, that was somewhat circuitous. I mean, I was I grew up in the sort of cypherpunk world. I was a kid on the on the internet when it was still text based, you know, and had to learn Unix and mm -hmm. and move around and FTP was a big deal and I remember, you know, those early days of seeing what appeared to be a decentralized uh, network of communication have so much promise and watching that evolve and seeing it sort of become the surveillance tool that it has is of course you know been terribly disillusioning as it has been for everybody um so i've 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 grown up uh, in a sense in in that hacker world and i I remember being very, very young when the very first Hackers on Planet Earth uh, happened and wanting to go so badly. And many, many years later, I was in graduate school and went to one of the HOPE conferences and and mm. sort of had this memory of like, oh, yeah, yeah, right. These, I, I remember this world. Yeah, here, here are my people. Um, and of course, when cryptocurrency started, um, it was it was such a fascinating thing, and my my background academically is in mathematics, and so to look at the cryptographic protocols that allowed for that to be possible were really exciting too, and to see how that all worked. Ideologically, I was brought up in a rather traditional leftist household, and I migrated further left, becoming more radical and adopting. Uh, anarchist ideals mm -hmm. that I developed along the way. And to see all of these things sort of start to co-mingle is really exciting to sort of see the the political aspect and the cultural aspect and the technical aspect and the scientific aspect sort of all come together to further things to make right. life better for people is is really exciting. And, you know, of course it's not working out as perfectly and ideally as we had all hoped, but it never does. And so that's, you know, that's part of why we're all here and why we keep working towards that. The medical angle for me um, came out of human rights work. Uh, I was part of a human rights envoy in El Salvador, and we were in a small village that had a little medical clinic that was run by a nurse and she showed the group around and showed what they had capacity for and what they were doing and then the rest of the group left and I stayed behind I was one of the few in the group that was comfortable with Spanish and I said you know this is really nice and thank you for showing us everything that works but can you show us what's not working and she said oh well we don't have any birth control and my jaw just hit the floor and I said, how, how is mm. that possible? That's, that's the most essential medication ever invented. How do you not have birth control? And she said, well, we ran out three months ago. And I said, how's this possible? You're a socialist country. Uh, can't you call the main hospital in San Salvador and ask for more? And she said, well, we did. And they said, no tenemos tampoco. Like we don't have any either. Mm. And I, I kind of couldn't imagine that an entire nation had had their supply of the most essential medicine possible drained and and I thought about it I thought you know this isn't this isn't even under patent this is a uh, this is a 70 year old medication that 
is fairly easy to manufacture. What's what's the holdup? Right. Um, and so, you know, and I was thinking about it too. And uh, Salvador has just endless problems. They have they have the eighty eight percent of their water is contaminated, and they have these tremendous gang problems and drug problems. And and thinking about all of this, I thought, you know. You know they manufacture. There are meth labs and ecstasy labs, and they're 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 cooking down cocaine into crack not far from here. I thought, you know, the the chemistry required to make birth control is not that sophisticated. I could set up a lab here. I mean, how hard could it be? <laughs> and it that idea sort of developed, and and I thought, gosh, you know, if I'm if I'm I could certainly do that for this one place, but. That's sort of a garbagey, imperialistic sort of idea of like I'm going to come in and save these people. <laughs> um, what you want to do is you want to say, hey, look, if you guys want birth control, here's how to make it. Mm-hmm. Um, especially since if it was a problem in the entire country, me, you know, setting up shop in this little village that I had a personal connection with is only going to help those people. Right. And so I thought, all right, well, I need to be, you know, distributing information. I need to help people figure out how to do this on their own. And I thought, gosh, you know, if I'm doing this, I should be doing this with antiretrovirals for HIV in Botswana. And then I thought, well, gosh, you know, if I'm doing this, I should be doing this for every medication everywhere. And then that was sort of the thing of saying, well, where's the, where's the gap? Why aren't people doing mm-hmm. this already? And it's, of course, there's a, there's a stigma against science. Oh, it's, it's, it's scary. It's difficult. It's this thing that only, you know, people with letters after their name who are attached to institutions do. Um, and so most of the project has been, you know, how do you, how do you release that sort of stigma, that, that fear of doing something technical? And it's interesting to see when you think about something like computers, uh, in the eighties, if you look at the zeitgeist, the computers were this scary thing. Everybody was afraid of them. It was something that, that geeks used and it was, it was weird and, Oh, it's going to set up world war three or, or maybe it's going to save us all. <laughs> um, and now it's not a big deal anymore, right? We all have a computer in our pocket and one, on our lap and one on the desk at home and everybody's got one. It's not a big deal. And there's computers and everything and, and we're all just cool with it. You know, and the same sort of thing, not too long ago, rapid prototyping was this niche thing for very specific industries. And now we throw 3d printing around. It's a, it's a household world. Everybody knows what that means. Right. Um, so what was the thing that facilitated that shift when when you look at it, two things change in each of those cases. One was there was a little bit of automation for the things that are difficult and easy to screw up. And the second thing is, is that there's a good front end user interface. I mean, and even the same thing with the internet, right? In the old days when you had to navigate around from the command line, like nobody was on there, mm-hmm. but now the fact that it's a graphical user interface and that things are automated, like everybody does everything online. And so the question arose like, well, can't we do this for chemistry? And the answer is, well, yes. And not only can we, but people have been doing automated chemistry for a long time. The only problem is, is that automating chemistry is something that's done by companies for profit with a lot of proprietary hardware and it's very expensive and typically mm-hmm. it's only sold to institutions or places that call themselves labs. But from a technical standpoint, it's not all that complicated. Most of the time you're trying to regulate a chemical reaction. So what are you doing? Well, you're stirring it. You're trying to regulate temperature. You're trying to inject reagents at particular times. Every so often for very specific things, you'll need a little extra, but Most of the time, that's most of what you're doing. And that, from a technical standpoint, is not that difficult to do or to automate. And so that was the Apothecary Micro Lab, and that's how it started. And since then, we've been branching out um, by request, mostly, 
Um, when you mentioned the, the EpiPencil project, that came out of just a lot of people hitting us up through the web forum saying, hey, why aren't you doing something about this? And eventually we said, well, maybe maybe we should. And, and it worked out pretty well, that one. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 fascinating, and uh, you know, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm um, going back to a, a point you made a little bit uh, a little bit earlier about how all these different fields are converging on anarchism um, in pursuit of freedom, um, and that's what's that's what's so cool. Like uh, I I've been, I interviewed uh, Ivan the Troll twice on 3D printing, you know, guns and gun parts. So what you're doing, you know, fits right in line with that. Um, I mean, there's just so much. Um, um, there's there's you know, and then there's obviously the crypto the crypto anarchy angle, the Bitcoin angle with uh, privacy wallets. I mean, there's so much stuff uh, half happening and so many different fields it's just really really uh, really cool to see um so i guess uh um where do you where do you see um and, and yeah. you, you did a uh you did a talk at the institute of crypto anarchy in prague um so i i'm I, and you, you kind of talked about mm. this a little bit um where do you see your work falling within crypto anarchy um and i ask because this is a crypto anarchism series so i'm just curious <sighs> uh, curious as to your thoughts yeah so um so smuggler gave a talk at that conference that I really enjoyed where he tried to break down the concept of crypto anarchy and what what f actually falls into that realm and, and what doesn't or what should and, and how do we define it and what's the what what really falls under that umbrella and what doesn't and and it's a difficult thing to pick apart but he had this um really nice model where he was talking about subjects, acts, attribution, judgment, punishment. And when you look at rulership, the, the interesting thing is that, right, you basically see, you see, you see individuals who, who do things or commit acts. And then once that act is attributed to that person, there's a judgment that it's, given that's you know comes from norms um and then there's a punishment that's doled out and traditionally anarchy the the strategy for bringing anarchy into reality is to remove the punishment or the the institution or the actors who can enact punishment and then that cycle breaks while in the crypto world, what's interesting is that you're doing something slightly different. What you're doing is you're breaking the cycle in in two spots, but they're different. You removed the possibility to observe, and you remove the possibility to attribute. So you can see that there are things going on, but you don't know who's doing it. You can't see. So while that might inform certain norms and you decide what you think is right or wrong, there's no longer a way to say, oh, that happened and it was that person. And so mm -hmm. even if there is still a mechanism for punishment, being unable to attribute or what's going on, then suddenly that, that opens up a lot of freedom because now you're no longer bound. What are people going to, if I do that, people going to say, or what are people going to do to me, or what are institutions going to do to me? Um, and so in terms of, and so you see that happening in terms of utilization of anonymity networks, uh, cryptography, um, cryptocurrency, all of a sudden, most of the normal things that you look at that are the things that you want to do when you go through your daily life that you can start to opt out of, more and more of these start to fall under that umbrella of being able to opt out of institutions. Um, of course, monetary things are a big one that came about with cryptocurrency. There are a lot of people who are starting to try to manufacture their own food on a micro scale, um, opting out of legal systems. One of the things that was very promising with Ethereum was the development of smart contracts to sort of circumvent the need for 
arbitration in courts over legal agreements, um, citizenship, other things like that. People are still looking for these solutions. And one of those key things that is traditionally institutionalized is health. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's so – it's so pernicious, the, the concept of health. It's almost invisible. We, we experience it every moment of our lives, and yet it's kind of invisible because if, if we're healthy, we don't think about it much. Mm -hmm. You get up, you go about your day, you eat, you sleep – Hopefully you hydrate and take a walk and you get good sleep um, and you can maintain your health pretty well with you know those basic things. Um, but as soon as that breaks down, two things happen that are really critical in terms of the way we interface with the world. One is, of course, ultimately, if you're very sick, it can deprive you of life entirely. Mm -hmm. But even if you're only – if you're not mortally ill, but you are ill, even on a very basic level of just you have a flu for a few days, it removes the possibility of doing those things which make life meaningful. If you're True. laid out and you're sick – you can't do any of those basic things, you know, any of the things that you would want to do, any of that interaction with the world or living your life, those things are suddenly taken away from you because you, you just can't do it. Um, as, as much as people would like to think about the glory of perhaps uploading their consciousness into some, you know, collective mainframe somewhere, uh, until that's a reality, if it's ever a reality – the thing is we have to deal with corporeality. That's a thing. You're in this in this body. And if it's not working, then everything else goes by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So it's it's important to really think about that. And if you talk with social activists who are chronic disease sufferers who are public about it, you can really see how – intensely it impacts their lives. I think Asher Wolf is a great example of this. She's down in Australia and and talks very publicly about how she's interfacing with the public health system in Australia and how she suffers from um, a chronic syndrome, which I'm going to mispronounce, but I believe it's called Ehlers-Danlos Danlos syndrome. And it it's characterized by a bunch of things, but there's chronic pain and there are issues with uh, ligaments stretching and just not being able to pick things up or reach for high shelves without dislocating your shoulder. I mean, that's a mm. big, big deal. Yeah. And we don't think about that the same way we do about HIV or hepatitis or diabetes or heart disease. But there are so many things out there that people don't think about and don't care about because if you don't have them, they kind of just fade into the background. But this is a big, big deal, and if we're going to be good fellow citizens and care about each other, we need to think about all the many people who deal with all the many things that make doing basic day-to-day -day stuff so hard. And I think, I think – you know, that needs to also extend to, to mental health. There are a lot of people who suffer from depression and don't get care. And it's so difficult to do anything if you can't even get out of bed in the morning because your your brain is just not giving you any help. And and so to try to put and and, and, and the key thing in all of this, I think, is that all of these things have treatments. Now, we don't have cures for everything, but we have ways to manage and make a lot of these at least significantly better. The technology's on the shelf. Mm -hmm. We've been spending, you know, all of humanity since since there have been humans, there has been medicine, and we've been spending all of that time that civilization has been developing developing 
different treatments, medications, cures, strategies for managing all of the ailments that occur in the human organism. And the sad part, or I should say the angering part, the part that's unacceptable to me is that these things are on the shelf and there are people who don't have access. Mm -hmm. That That is unacceptable. Yes, okay, so there are some diseases we don't have cures for. That's That I understand, sure, that we can't fix everything. But those that we can fix, there's zero reason why they shouldn't be fixed in everybody. Mm-hmm. And the fact that people suffer through disease and they die totally unnecessarily while this technology sits on a shelf is just maddening. And so our our goal is to try and take that down off the shelf and say, hey, look, that that knowledge, that information, that belongs to humanity and you can use it however you want. And this sh- shouldn't be barriered by an institution. This should not be barriered by anything. Knowledge belongs to the world and take it and use it as you see fit. And that's that's a central tenet of freedom when we talk about human rights. I mean, where does how do you how do you root something like that? Well, okay, we're humans, okay? Mm-hmm. And how do you build a human right? Well, what does it mean to be human? Well, you have a human body, you have a human mind. That's what sets you apart as a human, more or less. Okay. So you should be able to do whatever you want with your body and you should be able to do whatever you want with your mind. That means you should be able to access all of the information that humanity has ever created and you should be able to use that however you see fit to adjust your body and Im- improve your health. Um, and so we're just trying to bridge that gap a, a little bit a little bit more. Right, right. Uh, very good, very good. So I, I want to dig into the apothecary micro lab a little more here. Um, so um, I found yeah. uh, uh, so I, I have a picture going here for the for the YouTube video of uh, you giving a talk. I think it was uh, was it uh, it wasn't at uh, Hackers Congress. Um, was it at DefCon by chance? Uh, uh, which one? So I've spoken both at DefCon and at Hackers on Planet Earth. Okay. Um, in terms of like tra- traditional hacker conference, there have been a few others, but those are the big ones. Okay. Or the famous ones, I should say. Got you. Okay. Well, um, well, yeah, I, the the image is one of where you, I think you gave a demonstration of the of the actual micro lab. Um. So, um, I, I. Oh, that one was at Body Hacks. Body Hacks. Yeah, I think the one where it's glowing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So that one was in Texas. That's at Body Hacks, which, um, which. Um, doesn't exist anymore, but for a few years it ran and was a uh, – it was about bodily autonomy and body modification. Um, really, really fun conference for a while. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm just I'm, – I'm curious. Uh, like I said, we've been talking about 3D printing guns and gun parts for the past uh, couple of weeks. So this fits in perfectly. I mean it would make even more mm-hmm. sense to drop a few hundred dollars on a 3D printer if you could – both 3D print, you know, guns and also, uh, you know, synthesize your own medicine. Um, so, so I guess uh, what's what's right. what's been the uh, the progress currently uh, with uh, the the micro lab? I mean, is uh, is it, are the plans available to people now? Um, uh, where where are you guys at in the process? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure how much is posted currently, but there are there are torrents up of of previous versions. The 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 wonderful my favorite thing about it is that most of it is all off the shelf parts there are a few things that you 3d print um but the the central portion of the unit are two mason jars there's one small one and one large one mm-hmm. one fits inside the other and you screw them together uh, with this one part that's sort of the core um And that's a part that you 3D print. And it has a port in the center where you put in a stirring rod, which you can buy on Amazon uh, for 20 bucks. And then there are two ports on the edge that pump uh, water or glycerol or water alcohol combination through the outer jar. And that regulates the temperature of the inner jar. Um, And then... You have one more port 
that injects reagents, and that comes from a, a syringe pump. And that syringe pump is not our design. Um, that was, again, an open source project developed by a, a friend of ours, Nies uh, Nukomo, in, um, in Spain. Um, she built this wonderful syringe pump. It runs off a stepper motor. You hmm. put in a couple of rods and a couple of uh, screw bars and a couple of 3D printed parts and a syringe. And that gets a signal from the central unit. And so the central unit is a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. Okay, and very then, cool. Um, yeah, and again, so everything's pretty cheap and you can sort of throw it together. And then there's the the programming. And that, of course, is the tricky part because previous to the programming, you have to sort of do the chemistry. And the the goal of the chemistry we do is to try to find synthesis pathways for the drugs we want to manufacture that have greater margins of error, right? Because that's the thing that everybody's afraid of. The first thing right. that comes to everybody's mind when they hear about this is like, oh, what if I do it wrong? Right, which is of course the same reason why people are afraid to like use the command line um, in a computer or or mess with anything. Oh, oh, what if I screw it up? Shouldn't I take you know? Ah, uh, you know, people are afraid to change their oil mm -hmm. for the same reason. Oh, what if what if I get it wrong and ruin my engine? It's like maybe just spend an hour reading about what this means, and and you right. could just realize that changing your oil just means you unscrew one screw. And you wait for the fluid to drop, and then you screw it back in, and then you refill it. It's really not as big a deal as you <laughs> think. And of course, yes, doing chemistry is a little more complicated than changing your oil. But in the same way, if you have a conceptual framework of what's happening, then that fear goes away, right? The fear – that fear is an extremely strong controlling force. And when you talk about – you know, the freedom that crypto anarchy brings, it comes from it comes from circumventing oppression. Mm -hmm. When we talk about oppression, oppression comes from resource control. That's sort of a foregone conclusion. Well, where does resource control come from? Well, the antecedent is information control. You can't control resources if you're not already controlling the information. Well, how does information get controlled? Well, information gets controlled when it's commodified, and the only way you can commodify it is if you say, well, let's not explain why this works. Let's only say what to do. And there's a great example of this that's dear to my heart that everybody can relate to, math class. You go into a math class, and typically the experience that you have is somebody says, good morning. We're going to be doing this type of problem that has a strange name that I'm not going to explain. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through these steps. Here are the steps that you need to do. You're going to memorize these. Now do 100 of them. And if you do these steps correctly and remember them, at the end, you should get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Check. And that fear that builds. I mean, I have a PhD in math, and I still remember having had that. Why is that? The reason is... If you're going through a procedure with no understanding of what that's doing mechanistically, you're navigating a minefield blindfolded with nothing but a map saying, now take two steps forward right. and don't screw it up or you're going to die. And But you, don't, you have no idea like why, why does it have the structure that it does? And if instead somebody said, hey, look, here are these goggles that will show you metal and then send you out to the minefield. You're like, no big deal. Just don't touch those things. And so when, if you can take any concept and go back to its conceptual roots and say, here's how this works, then it becomes a toy and people aren't afraid to play with it anymore. And it's the same thing with any technology, right? People now who've grown up on computers, right, it's, it's no big deal. You just mess around with it and eventually you figure out how it works. It used to be that people were like, oh, I'm afraid to do that. What if I screw it up? You know, same thing with, you know, again, car maintenance or, or firearm maintenance, right? I mean, those mm -hmm. are scary things and bad things can't go wrong if you, if you do the wrong thing with them. But if you understand the inner workings <clears throat> of how the machine works – and what it does and why, then that fear goes away because 
you have a conceptual understanding of how it's going. So hopefully what we can do is we can sort of step back and say, all right, look, there's chemistry going on here. And if you want, you can actually understand what's happening and why. Now, not everybody wants to take the time and that's okay, but there's a trade-off there where you're going to be a little more anxious when you're going through it. Fair. All right. Not everybody has the bandwidth for that. But to try to safeguard them, what we're doing is our chemistry team is doing some really wonderful work where they go through and they're finding alternate synthesis pathways that for those who don't want to invest the, the time and thought – to develop the understanding, mm -hmm. they can still go through and follow a set of instructions with a little less fear because if it fluctuates a couple of degrees or if you, you let it react a, a little too long or not long enough or if you, if you don't measure quite properly, there's enough slop there that A, the reaction won't go wrong and you get some weird side chain reaction with weird stuff going on or, or, or a failure. And for the – if there is an incomplete reaction, the garbage both gets filtered out in a purification step and doesn't produce anything toxic. So if you do have a little leftover and it ends up in your pill, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good, very good. So I, I guess you kind of spoke to, uh, to how difficult this is to do. And, uh, you know, I, I'm right there with you. I mean, I, I've been, um, I mean, I've, I've been talking about uh, on podcasts, you know, 3D printing guns and shit. But I had never, um, I, I, there was, a, there was so much I didn't, didn't understand that I just, I never really thought about doing it myself. Um, but, right. um, you know, now that I've interviewed Ivan um, a couple of times, spent, you know, uh, four, four and a half hours talking to him, um, I know it's not that difficult. Um, I know it's not. Um, and if a 3D printer yeah. only costs a couple few hundred dollars, uh, you know, why not start messing around with it? Um, why not? Um, so, um, yeah, it's, indeed. it's basically about, you and know, once you, once like, you, once you learn it, once you understand it, or you have a better understanding it, it yeah, that the fear kind of goes away. That's the point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. And so that's the thing is that if somebody, if you've never handled a firearm before, but you know what it is and somebody hands you a gun, like that's going to be a terrifying experience. You have this thing that might go off at any time. You don't know what's safe, what's not, and you, you have to – and yes, of course, it's a powerful tool, and we should treat it with a lot of respect. However, when suddenly you step back a little bit and you say, okay, here's how this works. We have a chemical reactions, two chemical reactions. One is an initial um, transference of a physical strike – to a small fire uh, chemical that then burns a larger f chemical fire that allows for gases to expand very quickly. Okay. If you can contain that expanding gas correctly, then you can push a projectile in a particular direction uh, fairly quickly and over a fairly predictable pathway. All right, cool. When you think about it in those abstract terms, that's not super scary. And when you can think about sort of the mechanisms that have been developed over the years for firearms, then all of a sudden, yeah, you still treat it with a lot of respect because like a car or, you know, a solvent, yeah, it can be dangerous if you use it incorrectly. Mm -hmm. But again, there's there's the freedom then to say, oh – well, yeah, I can I can experiment with this and and utilize it prudently in a way that I can learn from and that you know will will teach me things and will will make it so that I don't need an intermediary anymore to utilize it for me. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so, so I guess a question that's probably on the minds of uh, on the minds of my listeners is: um, so there's this, uh, uh, and I have the, I, I, I'm, I'm the, looking at that picture again. You know, this really, really cool looking thing that uh, you know synthesizes uh, you know drugs and medicine. Well, what sort of things uh, can you can you manufacture currently in uh, one of these micro labs? So the things that we've worked on um, and the things that we continue to work on, we have sort of a big, big five which is really a big six because one of the drugs is, is two drugs um, or two compounds. Um, but the first one that we did was Daraprim. 
Uh, that's a that's a brand name. The active pharmaceutical in- ingredient is pyrimethamine, um, and that was the Martin Shkreli Turing Pharmaceuticals drug. That was sort of the one that we came out with mm-hmm. um, when we first came up from being an underground organization. Uh, it treats toxoplasmosis. Now, toxoplasmosis is a parasite. A lot of people have it. I probably have it. Most people who own cats have it. Mm. Um, and for most people, it's not dangerous at all. Uh, it it makes you, you know, maybe a little more thrill seeking. <clears throat> but it's not a dangerous. Uh, it's not a dangerous parasite in general. But if you have a suppressed immune system, advanced stages of cancer, advanced stages of HIV, um, or you're pregnant, it's it's very dangerous. Mm, okay. And and currently, pyrimethamine is the only drug that actually treats it. Pyrimethamine was originally developed to treat malaria, and and it, for you know decades and decades, it wasn't a big deal if you had toxoplasmosis in your system. Like no big deal. You take a course of treatment. Um, I think it's ten days of pyrimethamine. You take one initial dose of uh, um, I'm trying to remember the dosage, but you, you you take a quadruple dose the the first day, and then you take a regular dose subsequent days. Um, and each of those doses was thirteen and a half dollars. So that that's accessible to just about everybody. Um, and then. What happened was Turing Pharmaceuticals bought the rights to manufacture Daraprim and literally overnight changed the price from $13.5 a pill to $750 a pill. And this, as you can imagine, (laughs) raised a lot of controversy. Um, Martin Shkreli defended his action by saying, look, most people, this is going to be paid for by your insurance. We're trying to raise money so that we can develop a better drug because this drug is fairly toxic and there are a lot of so-called side effects that aren't great. And it would be nice if we had something that was a little more targeted. So we're raising money to pour back into R&D so we can make a better drug. Um, So which parts of that are actually true and which parts are not? Um, The parts that are true are they did pour a lot of money back into R&D. When I spoke with him, he claimed that they actually had gotten to a point where they did have a drug that was better targeted. Um. However, Martin Shkreli's a little out of touch with the average Joe in America and doesn't realize that most people aren't just, oh, yeah, my insurance takes care of everything, not a problem. A lot of people have financial issues where just a copay is a financial burden, and a lot of people are still uninsured. And of course, that's gotten worse in recent years. And so this was a big deal that suddenly people didn't have access to this drug. So that was the first one that we did. Um, and that was a fairly simple molecule. It's it's symmetric. It's flat. Uh, it's small. Um, and we are fairly pleased that we developed a synthesis pathway that's significantly simpler than the traditional one. Um, fewer steps, much greater margins of error. And that one's pretty easy to do. Um, nice. The other ones we are working on, yeah. So the the other ones. So so we we're thinking about the that one we did sort of as a well this this needs to be taken care of now. Uh, but the big the big four things that we are trying to attack are okay big problems: HIV, hepatitis C, opioid overdose. And abortions, like these are these are issues that are facing the world and specifically the United States in big, big ways. And so we're like, okay, how do we attack each of these? And the thing that's interesting is, again, as I was talking about, there are technologies on the shelf that come in a pill that take care of most of these. So 
Hepatitis is a virus. And traditionally, if you have a virus, you just manage it for the rest of your life. It's very hard to eradicate a virus from your system because of the way they work. But there's a new treatment out that actually can eradicate hepatitis C from your body, which is mm, an epic, wow. epic thing. Um, because people living with hepatitis C you know, have a multitude of things with which they have to deal continuously for their entire lives. But now you can actually eradicate it. And the way that this works is there are antivirals, but those antivirals don't do it because the virus sort of hides out in what's called the viral reservoir. And there are a number of places where it does this. It'll hang out in your connective tissue and in, in other tissues and stay dormant. And then when the, it comes through and your system gets flushed, they'll say, oh, hang on, we're coming back out. And then they'll multiply. Now, what uh, Sovaldi does uh, is that it actually drains the viral reservoir and it brings all of those ones that are dormant out. And then you continuously do this for 12 weeks and you take an antiviral and there's no hepatitis C left in your system. It's, it's an incredible, incredible technology. Um, and, it's, and it's a pill. You take one pill uh, once a day for 12 weeks. The problem is, is that these pills are thousand dollars. So if you are the kind of person who has eighty two, eighty four thousand uh, dollars $84,000 just burning a hole in your pocket, then hepatitis mm -hmm. C doesn't have to be your problem anymore. But if you're a regular person, uh, no such luck. Um, so we're, we're looking to manufacture that one. That's a fairly complex molecule. And so we're still struggling with that one a little bit. Um, but we're hoping to get that one out there because hepatitis – concern for hepatitis is now starting to overtake concern for HIV because it's much more virulent. And especially amongst intravenous drug users, you can, you can sort of flush a syringe even though you should never do that. You should use fresh needles and syringes if you're an intravenous drug user every time. Um, but – Virulence of hepatitis C is much higher, and so the things that would normally keep you a little safer from HIV don't from hepatitis, and hepatitis is blowing up. And because, in part because it's known that there's a cure now, people are being less careful, and so it's a, it's a problem. So we're trying to make that a little more accessible. Um, HIV, of course, is another big one on the list. Um, and we don't have a cure for HIV uh, yet, although there are some there is some very promising research out there, things that will similarly drain the viral reservoir. Um, but at the moment, we're still working with antiretrovirals, uh, which can manage the condition. The most promising one is uh, one that was originally tagged as GSK744 and is going to be um, marketed under the trade name Cabotegravir. And what it does is it acts as uh, an antiretroviral, both as a pre-exposure prophylaxis and also as a traditional treatment. So this is a very powerful thing. You can, you can use it for both. And the really big deal about this one is that when put in a nanoparticle suspension and then given as an intramuscular injection, this can keep you safe for four months at a time from a single dose. And this is a huge, huge deal because if you – under the current – regimens. If you have HIV or if you are trying to keep yourself safe from HIV, you're taking pills every day and you need to take them more or less at the same time every day. Some of them you have to take, you know, with food or without food at different times. And, and if you screw this up slightly, your risk of either transmitting it or contracting it goes up significantly. Mm, yeah. To have yeah. something that you can do four times a year and it'll just keep you safe is an incredible difference for adherence 
trying to get somebody to take a shot four times a year is significantly easier than trying to get people to take pills every day at the same time. And the real magic is that because it works for both protection from exposure and protection from transmission to keep people's viral loads below detectable Mm -hmm. and transmittable is that you could go into a community where the sort of communal viral load is very high, where a lot of people have it, or even where not a lot of people have it, and you could wipe it out without the stigma of testing. And that's the hardest part is usually you have to separate the people who have it from the people who don't, and you treat them differently, which is a big problem sociologically, right? Because Mm -hmm. you're stratifying the community. Yeah. Instead, what you can do with this technology is you can come into a group and say, hey, we know that some people have this and we don't care who and we don't know who and it doesn't matter who. We're going to give everybody the same medication. Everybody line up. And if you don't have it, this will keep you from getting it. And if you do have it, this will keep you healthy. And we're going to do this again in you know next season. And you do this – I mean this is a technology that could – actually wipe out HIV in a single generation if we deployed it. But GlaxoSmithKline is probably not going to be giving that technology away. However, we'd like to be giving their technology away. <laughs> right. um, so we're working on that one too. Um, again, that one is also a very complicated molecule. It has two stereo centers. Um, and there we are working and getting better methods of, of manufacturing it. But at this point still, it's, it's tricky and expensive, but we're, we're whittling away at that. Now the two others, um, uh, opioid overdose and abortion, those are much more within reach. Um, so opiate overdose, we actually put on the back burner for a while because it's so, so if, if somebody goes into opioid overdose, there's a drug called naloxone which you can administer either intravenously or through a nasal spray, which is, of course, much easier to do. Mm -hmm. Um, And it will immediately end their overdose. They'll just come straight out of it. Now, we put this kind of on the back burner for a little while because of a couple reasons. First of all, it's becoming a little more accessible. Uh, In the United States especially, more and more states are allowing it to be over the counter or kind of quasi over the counter. I've forgotten which state are you in? Uh, I'm in Illinois. Illinois. Um, yeah. So I believe Illinois has the similar policy to what's in California where it's not technically over the counter. You can't just like buy it and walk out. But what you can do is go to a pharmacy and the pharmacist can prescribe it to you and then sell it to you on the spot. Ah, uh, okay. Um, this, so, and, and I'm not sure you should check on Illinois' laws, but I know this is how it is in California um, or, or was uh, a while ago when I still lived there. Um, and it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly affordable and you can get it and everybody should carry it. There's no reason why – you shouldn't be carrying it. Everybody should be carrying it. Um, and so so it varies state to state in the U.S., but even very progressive countries like Iceland, it's not accessible. Um, and there are plenty of states where you can't get naloxone unless you go to a hospital or to a police station. And not to put anybody in a box, but there are a lot of people who are, if they're overdosing on opioids, the last place they want to go is a police station or hospital. Right. Um, and so putting that technology in the hands of people was, you know, very appealing. There's another problem though, which is the structure of naloxone is so similar to the structure of opioids that the precursors that are necessary to make it are the same precursors that you would use to make the opioids. And so wow. they're very, very highly controlled. It was very hard to get. And so given those, the fact that it was very difficult to get the precursor more accessible, we were like, okay, well, maybe we should put this on hold. But then things started getting worse, and we got worried, and we were like, okay, how do we crack this nut? And we had this idea uh, about a year ago that was this moment where we said, okay – well, they won't let us have the antidote because 
It's uh, for silly reasons. And it's like, okay, and they won't let us have the things to make the antidote because they're too similar to the poison. What if we just make the antidote from the poison? And so the chemistry team started working it out and figured out a way that we can actually manufacture naloxone from oxycodone. Oh, wow. In two steps. <laughs> Because they're so very similar. So oxycodone you can make into oxymorphone in one step. I think it's about an 87% yield, which is really high, and oxymorphone is much stronger. This was something that was developed by drug dealers in the 90s that would just quadruple their yield because it was stronger stuff. They could just do this one step and then cut it down. And oxymorphone you can make into naloxone in one step. It's, and, and the poetry <laughs> of making the... Making the antidote from the poison is, uh, I think, wonderful. Um, and w when I first presented what our chemistry team had done, right after I gave uh, my talk, I walked out and the doorman at the hotel offered to sell me oxycodone. Like as I left the building right after my talk, <laughs> and I said, oh man, you couldn't ask me on the way in? I could have made this shit on right. stage. It would have been great. <laughs> So, um, well, I, I, so just, I just want to ask, ask, I wanna ask a question yeah. on that. Yeah. That's 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 interesting. So, yeah. So the, so so you took oxycodone in two steps. Had basically not, uh, what, what naloxone or whatever it's called. It's really that similar. Mm -hmm. So is it just like the the antithesis yeah. of it, or, it, or what is it? Um, if if you could talk more about, just I'm I'm curious. Oh, how it how it works in terms of the pharmacology of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um. So. <sighs> My knowledge of his mechanism of action is not sophisticated, um, but it works, I believe, as an agonist and just makes it so that the, the, the opioid receptors can't take um, any opiates anymore. So it's like they can't bind. And so all of that action just stops. Um, uh, and again, uh, that's as I understand it. I haven't looked deeply into the pharmacokinetics of it. Uh, the the medical team that we have understands it in a much more sophisticated way than I do. And it's a, a very established technology that's been used for a long time and apparently is very, very safe. So you can, you can give it to somebody and they will come out of their, of their overdose instantaneously. Um, and the fact that you can administer it through a nasal spray is amazing because you don't have to have any, any specialized skills. It's not like, okay, how do I find this person's vein? Or uh, let me make sure I'm doing this correctly. It's like you, you stick this in somebody's nose and you push a plunger and it's done. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I would encourage everybody, everybody to carry this all the time because like, you know, yes, odds are like, I hope that nobody will ever have to use it, but the odds are that you will come across somebody who's in an overdose in your lifetime is uh, pretty high. And, you know, you just put it in your kit of stuff, you know, it's sort of if you think about people who are safety conscious, who carry things like oh, a tourniquet and inclusive chest seal, because, you know, in America, people get shot. And it's the same sort of thing. You just carry it around in hopes that you never need to use it. But it would be so much worse if you needed to use it and didn't have it. Sure. Um, so it's it's in my go bag all the time. It's 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 in my my blowout kit, and when I do um, street medic work, it's one of the things that I always carry. Um, and so, yeah, if it's available to you, get it. And if it's not available to you, you can make it um, and or go to a neighboring state with uh, slightly m more humanitarian laws con <laughs> concerning mm -hmm. such things, and you can get it. So um, I guess I guess another question and another question that just came to mind: Could you go the opposite direction? Yeah. Go from the uh, the uh, naxalone to the actual opioid, or is it only one way? And you may not know. I'm just curious. I just thought of it. <laughs> um, I'm I'm just trying to think about it theoretically. I I think it would be a lot harder, and it would be a real waste. Um, <laughs> it would be kind of silly. I mean, not sure. impossible. Uh, you know, in the, in the same way that from a nuclear physics perspective, you could make lead out of gold. I mean, sorry, you could make gold out of lead, but it would be such an expensive process that you wouldn't be making any money. It's the same sort of thing. Like, yeah, you could you could take naloxone and I guess you could make oxymorphone out of it, but it would 
it would you'd be wasting it. It would be very expensive process comparatively <laughs> if you were trying to get oxymorphone. Much better to just get that straight away. And <laughs> that's the other thing. It's like you know, um, ironically, and this is the whole reason we did this. Getting oxycodone is really easy. Ask anybody. It's like the most common drug in America. You can get it in every city in the United States with no problem. You know, it's just – it's everywhere because it's so overprescribed and right. there's such a pipeline of it that, you know, a lot of it gets lost, quote unquote, um, along the way and finds its way to the street. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's that's the thing, right? Oxy, oxycodone is not a commodity. That you can get. No problem. Right. You know, um, but naloxone is harder to get and this makes no sense. <laughs> it makes no sense. It should be the reverse. Yeah. Right. And so, and so that's why we, we did this in the first place is because it should be the other way around and it's, it's not yet. Right. <clears throat> very cool. Very cool. So I guess just a, a couple more questions for you real quick. Um, and, uh, um, I, I guess, uh, so yeah. you kind of laid out your, your big five or six. Um, are, are those, uh, are those, uh, Oh, right. I mean, the last one is the abortion drug and I forgot to mention that, but yeah, the abortion drug, of course, which is perhaps the most important of all is, uh, um, is, is one we're working on as well. So, um, just to go over that really quickly, it's cool. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, the 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 two drugs to have an abortion with pills are uh, misoprostol and mifepristone. Uh, misoprostol is the key one because you can do uh, medical abortion with m- misoprostol by itself, and that's what a lot of the Abortion care services, the underground networks that distribute pills to people use. And if you have that, uh, that's enough. And those are pretty easy to get. If you're clever about it, you can you can order those or get those through protected networks. It's also a medication that's prescribed for horse ulcers. So if you're in a rural area that has like a tack and feed store that serves, um, you know, farmers and you come in and you say, Hey, I know you guys have a vet license. I have this horse with these terrible ulcers and I need to give it, uh, misoprostol. Can you, can you give me a bottle of pills? Like, yeah. And they're like $2 a pill and they'll give you a, a bottle of a hundred for, you know, yeah, for 200 bucks. And it's not that big a deal. Um, if, if you can, you know, if you have a sympathetic vet type that'll do that, mm-hmm. um, the harder one, and so and so with that, it's it's roughly eighty five percent efficacy, uh, especially depending on how you catch it and and how well you go through the regimen. The full regimen is with um, mifepristone, which is also known as RU forty six, and that's harder to get a hold of. Um, so we've worked out a way that that can be made from estradiol, which is a, a hormone replacement therapy drug that's um, also falling into short supply because uh, America's political engine is extremely transphobic as well. So despite the fact that that's, you know, when it was used primarily for women going through menopause, it was very easily available. And then there were newer technologies developed for that, but that's still used for trans people. And because, you know, the America hates trans people, that's becoming harder and harder to find. So we're working on new mechanisms for that. Um, We will be at the Please Try This at Home conference in Pittsburgh in September, and we'll be doing a workshop, uh, specifically on how to manufacture your own abortion drugs, um, which will be pretty exciting. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, um, now this one, uh, I was, I was reading through your FAQ uh, earlier this week, just, just for the heck of it, just to, to just, I was looking mm-hmm. through the stuff on your site. And, um, I mean, there's a question that that was brought up and I, I'm, I'm guessing it's one you get asked a lot. Um, so, so basically long time listeners, of this podcast could give a fuck about copyright. Um, but for the new folks uh, out there that may be thinking about it, um, if someone makes their own medicine, are they stealing from patent holders? Well, 
it depends if you actually categorize that as theft. Um, I personally don't believe in intellectual property, and neither do um, I. <laughs> at one, yeah, well, um, and. And, and at one point, I actually was at a conference where somebody tried to nail me to the wall about it. And they're like, well, you're a scientist. What about your work? And I was like, everything I've ever published is in the public domain. Yeah. And they're like, what? what a, no, it's not. Everybody copyrights their PhD. And I said, no, nope, I had to pay the publishing uh, company that published my PhD extra money money specifically so that it was open access um so so i mean but okay for those people out there who believe that patent infringement is theft there's an inconsistency to the logic because if that is if that is the chain of your logic then denying medication to people is murder so in that case what we're doing is we're perpetrating an act of theft to prevent an act of murder. And from a moral standpoint, I think that's not only justified, I think that that's a moral imperative. So if you call that theft, then withholding medicine is murder and it's it's a justified act of theft. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, so um, so I guess before I let you go, do you have any uh, closing thoughts for, for the listeners? Uh, and, and also, too, if you have anything uh, you'd like to plug, uh, um, yeah, you can go ahead and do that if you'd like to. Sure. Yeah. Um, the, the one thing that I, I think, especially when, you know, since you bring up the, the question of intellectual property, I think that this is the big deal. Like we're, we're very proud of the work that we're doing, but ultimately I think we're sort of a historical footnote around much bigger issues. And the much bigger issue is this one concerning intellectual property. Throughout history, we've seen these critical junctures where economics and morality have come to an impasse. Way back in Europe, it happened during the Reformation. It happened during the Cold War. Most notably in the United States, it happened during slavery. And in each case, there was this exchange between the people who were defending the status quo and the people who saying there needed to be a change. And the people saying there needed to be a change said, listen, What's going on is wrong. It is amoral. It's immoral. It shouldn't be happening. And the response typically came, well, yes, it's a little weird and right. It's not what we'd all prefer, but this is the institution that we're sort of stuck with. And if we remove it now, then we're going to have this terrible problem because our entire economy would collapse because it's built on this thing, even though it is a little strange and unfortunate. And the response comes, well, that's not good enough. If that's what our economy is based on, we need a new economy. And of course, again, likening this back to slavery, that was the discussion. People can't be property. And the response comes from the people who are defending it. Yes, yes, they really shouldn't be, but, but they are. And that's how we become this very strong nation. That's where all of our money comes from. And, and if we just pull the rug out from under, it's going to be a disaster. And the response came, that's not good enough. If that's our economy, we don't deserve that economy and we shouldn't have it and we need to build something new. And I think the same thing is happening today. There are people who are dying as we speak because of the enforcement of intellectual property laws. People don't have access to all of these incredible medical technologies it says something really sad about the state of humanity when we spend all of this time and energy and resources and money to develop these medical technologies and then refuse to deliver them. And it's because of intellectual property law. And there are people who are standing up saying, this is wrong. This is wrong. People are dying because of this intellectual property law. That's not right. You would never, you would never know how to save somebody that you were watching die and say, well, I know how to save you, but I'm not going to because that's my idea and I'm not going to share. And so to say that's not good enough, the response continues to come in, in the same predictable way. Well, yes, that's very unfortunate. And yes, um, it would be better if that's not how things work. But 
this is how our economy works. Intellectual property drives the world economy. And yes, it's hackneyed and is derivative of ideas that came out of the Middle Ages when the printing press was developed. But this is sort of what we're stuck with. And if we just pulled out the rug, our, our economy wouldn't work. And there are some of us who are saying, well, that's just not good enough because this is not okay. Yeah. Yeah, very good, very good. So yeah, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Uh, website, uh, your your Twitter, uh, anything you'd like to, to point the uh, listeners uh, in the direction to? So 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 I'm on Twitter. I think I'm Michael S. Slaufer, um, and fourthesevinegar.org insight. Um, one of our other uh, spokespeople is going to be speaking in the UK um, in Coventry uh, next week at the Pirate Care Conference. Um, that'll be a really good talk. He'll be unveiling some new stuff. Um, that I haven't talked about yet. So if you're if you're in the UK, I recommend going to that. Um, we will be at DEF CON this year at the Biohacking Village, and we'll be unveiling some new things there. Um, very crypto anarchic related, trying to develop new new alternative infrastructure to have a decentralized internet. And yes, it's in the Biohacking Village. There is a biological component to it. Look out for uh, that. Okay. And and in um, September 14th in Pittsburgh, the Please Try This at Home conference, which is going to be cool. There are going to be a lot of really interesting people there. We're also going to be there, and we will be running a workshop where you can come in and uh, make your own abortion drugs, and you actually walk away with an entire kit of uh, pills. So come to any of those. Um, the website does have a contact us form. So if you'd like to get in touch and get involved or if you have ideas of things that we should look at, um, please contact us. And remember, if we don't get back right away, we get you know hundreds of emails a day and on certain days, hundreds of emails an hour. So bear with us. We'll try and get back to you eventually. Um, and we appreciate that you guys send it. We do read everything that comes through. Fantastic, fantastic. So, um, one of my questions is, what what what, what can people do to help? Um, well, if the the contact form is one, but you also have a donate page, uh, right? Do you want to um, let people know if, if there's any, any other ways they can help? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if people have Bitcoin that's burning a hole in their pocket, please throw it our way. We do appreciate it. Every little bit helps. Uh, the key thing, though, that we're looking for is we're looking for more people. If you have expertise in any regard, or even if you're just somebody who's good with handling logistical things or research, or there's anything you'd like to help with, we can use the help. And we're trying to organize people currently to try and get things together um, for a big push that we're going to have in the fall. So if people want to get involved, go ahead, throw your your skill set in the pool and and let's make the world better and healthier awesome awesome i'll put uh, all those links in the show notes uh um, michael thank you so much for coming on man it was a fascinating discussion and i uh, really appreciate the work that you're doing um because i mean if, if yeah if we if we don't have our health then what do we have um you can't if if, if you're unhealthy and you don't like shit all the time then you can't really be free uh so it's uh, certainly certainly it's true. important work uh, and i do appreciate it Thank you so much. It's been great being on your show, and I appreciate you having me. Hey, no problem. Uh, no problem at all. So um, thank you, Michael, for coming on, and thank you uh, for tuning in. Uh, sure to appreciate it. Uh, See so yeah, you until next time. Let's build the Agora, and let's build Second Realms. <laughs>